So it's a pristine pleasure to be here today, honoring the memory of Larry and sharing a few thoughts and feeling with you. And I'm really grateful to the organizer for making us to convene here today. Well, according to Dick, the given title of this talk is Working with Larry. Larry brought things into our lives and into science that were both unique and unexpected in many different respects. And he did it this way, gently and modestly. I cannot separate scientific from personal aspects of the relationship I enjoy with Larry. So what meant for me working with him is probably better illustrated by episodes and anecdotes than by general principles. To give you an idea of how scientific and personal aspects are intertwined for me, I think it's quite telling to mention that I spent my first wedding anniversary with Larry. <laughs> In addition to my wife, of course. It's true. <laughs> it was 2005, and we were in Turin with Bea de Gelder and patient DB to test some of Bea's ideas on the consequences of exposing blindside patients to affective stimuli. I was still a PhD student, and it was the first time I was given the opportunity to test one blindside patient. I still remember the excitement and surprise when we realized almost online that the behavioral results were so clear to make statistics almost unnecessary. It was the kind of feeling you experience the first time you fall in love, or the first time you testify a miracle, a scientific and very empirical miracle in this case. And those you are with in the presence of love and miracles you never forget. Life does not separate you, and death does not separate you. But let's go back to the beginning of the story in 2000, I attended as undergraduate the neuropsychology class chaired by Eduardo Biziak, another great scientist, great neuropsychologist. The topic was the neural correlates of consciousness and how they can be studied in neuropsychological methods. At the end of the course, I asked Biziak if he could suggest further readings, and he gave me two titles. One was an edited book, Consciousness in Contemporary Science, and the other one was Consciousness Lost and Found, already mentioned by many speakers before me. Right after, during the same year, Larry went to Milan to give a talk on blindsight and visual awareness. I attended the meeting, and during coffee break, I approached him with a proverbial beautiful idea. I wanted to integrate the study on emotions with blindsight and essentially test whether blindsight patients could discriminate above chance emotional expressions. To my great disappointment, Larry said that Bea de Gelder had already discovered the phenomenon and reported it in a collaborative paper published a year before under the name of Affective Blindsight. Months later, when I recovered from the news, I contacted Bea. I was lucky enough as we started a very fruitful and collabor fruitful collaboration and friendship that lasted ever since. Thereafter, we always worked hard on affective blind sight, very seriously, and we never had fun. <laughs> working with Larry meant working with a big man and it made you think, feel, and dream big. Big ideas, big discoveries, but also big doubts, problems, and big, maybe, maybe the blindside patient is using echolocation to avoid the obstacles instead of processing visual input non-consciously. And therefore, we set about to have proper control conditions. Maybe the effect of purple stimuli is not due to the lack of sensitivity in the colliculus to that specific wavelength. And so we added different stimuli with different colors. 
maybe the fibers that seem to connect the pulvinar with the amygdala are not originating from the visual part of the pulvinar. And thus, new analysis. Working with Larry was a healthy but tiring and painful exercise of skepticism on your favorite ideas. But it was a lesson on how to deal with others' critiques. From Larry's double quote, one way of dealing with errors is to have an enemy. An enemy is willing to devote a vast amount of time and brain power to ferreting out errors, both large and small, and this without any compensation. The trouble is that really capable enemies are scarce. Most of them are only ordinary. Another trouble with enemies is that they sometimes develop into friends and lose a great deal of their zeal. It was in this way that the writer lost his three best enemies. Everyone, not just scientists, need a good enemy. Working with Larry was always an unpredictable ride, always a work in progress. After a couple of weeks, I had moved to Oxford for a sabbatical semester, which ultimately stretched into two years. Larry asked me whether I was interested in joining him on a new collaborative project. Of course, I accepted enthusiastically, figuring out it must have been something on vision. Instead, it was a project on the auditory system, more precisely on subjects experiencing tinnitus. He had an original theoretical view that having tinnitus is the auditory equivalent of having a phantom limb, an empirical test relating the tonotopic profile of ear loss with a frequency of experienced tinnitus, and had already established contacts with a center where to recruit patients in Oxford. Nothing surprising for those who know Larry, who at the time, in 2015, was only 89 years young. Working with Larry meant approaching neuroscience from a psychological perspective. Larry was indeed first and foremost a psychologist. And as such, he always defended the leading role of psychology in the study of the mind and its neural basis, albeit in a collaborative enterprise with neighboring discipline. With his own words, psychological phenomena are the ultimate object of explanation. The explanation of something does not eliminate that something. Psychology sets not only the limits, but the actual directions along which inquiries from other disciplines should proceed. To those purporting that the discoveries of Larry's have supported a reductionist approach to mental function in terms of neural operation, Larry replied something that Kia already quoted. We did not reduce to their domains. They must elevate themselves to ours and we must elevate ourselves to embrace their contributions and their interests. Mutual interaction, mutual elevation, not reduction, are the ideals I seek. Working with Larry meant remaining always curious and open toward new methodological or conceptual advancements, but never prone to the moment fashion. For example, in the 80s, the golden period of cognitive sciences. It was critical about the disregard for the properties of the real nervous system and of those easily seduced by the conceptual nervous system. And he claimed that an abstract theory can make correct predictions but still be fundamentally wrong. There is an easy assumption that hardware can be ignored. But the distinction between hardware and software is not categorical. Are Huber and Wiesel orientation neurons soft or hardware? Working with Larry meant to become a part of a broader community. More precisely, multiple communities, big and small. The neuropsychology community, the vision sciences community, the department of experimental psychology community, the modern college community, and many others. The highest privilege of becoming a small and young member of such communities 
was that I met great scientists. And some of those even became good friends. Communities that got together quite happily and regularly. For example, in the occasion of Larry's 80th birthday during a workshop in London organized by John Barber and Aris Surahi. At EBBS meetings, as John reminded, here is when Larry became president for the second time in 1995, succeeding to Carlo Marzi. Or in Turin, for Larry's 90th birthday, when he was nominated honorary member of the Department of Psychology and of the Neuroscience Institute of Turin. During this last occasion, and thanks to the work of Bob Kentridge that also John mentioned, we organized a special issue in neuropsychology to pay tribute to Larry. The community reacted promptly. In fact, we have now an impressive lineup of contributors, and I'm very happy to see many of them here today. Working with Larry also meant to learn to become active in those communities. From his memoirs, among the achievements at Oxford, of which I'm especially proud, is the establishment of a cycle path that allowed one to cycle from Headington and Marston to the South Parks Road, and thence to the city center and the main university buildings. I submitted a proposal to the University Council in 1974. Finally, some 17 years after the initial proposal, the path was officially opened in November 1991. This was a concrete example of what is beautifully expressed in the words of an Italian novelist, Cesare Pavese. Your own village means that you are not alone, that you know there is something in you, in the people and the plants and the soil, that even when you are not there, it waits to welcome you. I would say to welcome you back. Working with Larry, also meant being exposed to a double weekly dose of Larry's humors and puns. Tuesday morning at the department and Friday for lunch at the college. When waiting on the lift at the department, I was asking, to which level? I could usually get two possible replies. One, we vision people always see. Or another one, to be or not to be. <laughs> when walking at the university parks or at the college gardens and asking, do you feel tired? You call expect, no, I'm retired. Well, as every man of a considerable age, he had a number of ailments. So, I inquired one morning, how is your fit? Still aching? He replied, yes, but I do not defeat. Or, is your neck painful because of the weather? And he said, whether or not. Working with Larry was at the same time something unique and shared with those who work with him before, almost invariably eminent scientists. And we have a few remarkable examples today. From a random selection, Larry, to say that this essay could have not been written without your help would be a false and misleading understatement. You taught me virtually everything I know about brains and behaviors in monkeys and how to study them. It is only having left your laboratory that I have realized what a debt I owe to you and that the standards you set for us are far above the conventional contemporary ones. Charlie Gross. Or during the last three years, I have had the privilege of working under the supervision of Dr. Weisskranz. I cannot thank Dr. Weisskranz for all that he has done for me. I came to physiological psychology from another subject 
and he patiently guided me into this new field. At all stages of my research, his advice and criticisms have been invaluable and I have gained immeasurably from his wisdom and experience. And still, I am deeply grateful to my supervisor, Professor Weisskranz, who has been unceasingly generous with his help and ideas. Only those who have had the good fortune to work close to him will appreciate how much this has meant to me. Nick Humphreys. In the last years, we took good care of each other. And if working with Larry was like walking on sunshine, losing Larry was like losing the rain. I knew of Larry's passing by an email from Dick Passingham on the 27th of January. It was Saturday night and I was in France. When I came back home, I found this picture on the table. It displays the hands of the two of us while Larry was in Ifley in his last days. At the bottom, my wife quoted a sentence from Calvino, take life lightly, for lightness is not superficial, but gliding above things, not having weights on your heart. And then an additional note from her. When you can reach it, think of his hands, you will find it. These were feelings shared with many people who enjoy his friendship and company, many members of Larry's communities. He was a lovely man, and we will miss him very much, Kate Watkins. Again, a random selection. This is all so terribly sad. Larry was such an influence on me, such a support and friend, so funny, and such a kind, kind man. I realized that I really loved Larry. I will miss him so much, Bob Kentridge. I was so sad to hear the news. Larry was an inspiration and a friend of mine. He was a wonderful scientist, mentor, and teacher, as well as dear friend. I shall miss him very much, Barry Everett. And very touchy one was posted by the blind sight patient GY himself that Larry tested many times. Larry was an amazing man. He had a nasty habit of being right. He even amazed me by some of the correct predictions made about GY. As GY was fortunate enough to meet a lot of amazing people, but Larry certainly stood head and shoulders above the rest. He would be sadly missed by many people, not only of his academic ability, but also for his enthusiasm, humor, and warmth. He was and always will be an honor knowing him. Larry was my scientific idol, my friend, what I believe was my grandfather, my roommate, a sharpshooter, central forward football player, violinist, a husband and father. On this bench in the fellow garden, we had many conversation and what is written is true. But it's also true that as long as we remain active and curious and critical, Larry remains with us and still keep us together like today. I would like to leave you with the words that Larry pronounced in Turin in 2016 during the concluding remarks of the workshop in his honor, whose title was appropriately Standing on the Shoulder of a Giant. What happened to be the last time he talked in public? I think the moral of all of this is choose your friends wisely. Choose your location wisely. And good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.